So, so I thank you all for coming out on what um, certainly feels like one of the warmest nights of the year. No matter how, how often you enjoy wine, education is such a, a critical component um, of the wine experience. You can ask vignerons this, you can ask sommeliers this, you can ask servers, you can ask aficionados, you can ask newbies. Um, if you don't learn, if you're not always learning, you're not enjoying wine to its fullest potential. Um, and when you're doing it in a group of people, what better way to enjoy and celebrate education with, than with other people looking to celebrate that, that same region, that same education, that same experience. So again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, and so this is kind of the overview that we're looking to take um, with this new program. So here we are at Seminar 1, The Taste of Bordeaux. This is going to give you a, an overview of the region. Um, we'll dip a little bit into history. We do have a, a short amount of time here. Honestly, I, we could probably spend, I mean, there's an, this is an entire organization founded upon Bordelais wines. We could spend far more than an hour doing this. Um, but we're going to try to limit ourselves and our, in our revelry and our passion um, for Seminar 1. Seminar 2, the quality of Bordeaux, top to bottom. It's important to see Bordeaux not just from the very lofty heights um, that it often achieves, but also from the ground floor and understanding what caused, you know, really this global surge of Bordelais wine. Why is it important? Why is it critical to the wine market? Um, and then we get down to the regions of Bordeaux. Here we're going to start to dig in a little bit into the terroir, a little bit into the communes, um, a little bit into what really makes these wines so unique. Why does saint Emilion taste different from Pomerol? Why does Poyac differ from saint Estef? Um, so some things to look forward to as we kind of start to develop this program, but here we are tonight starting at the beginning. Um, so a little bit, again, kind of Eric uh, alluded to me, um, and this is just a summary of what I've done in the wine world. It looks impressive, but I've spent a lot of money on education, and somehow that kind of helps you get where you're going. Um, but also some pretty cool places like Espalier, uh, Saddle de Terre, which used to be around in Boston, sadly. Um, I do have a culinary degree. I worked at Hammersley's Bistro. I apparently have a habit of working for places that close down shortly after I work there. I guess I'm not getting hired by restaurants anytime soon, but some educational roles with Treasury Wine Estates and Jackson Family Wines. Uh, so really I've seen kind of the evolution and the growth of wine um, from the grower, from the workers out in the fields all the way to the dining room table. Um, so if you have questions tonight, I definitely want to encourage them. If I don't get to your questions, um, I will be around for the entire evening. I will try to make it around. I know we have a, a wonderful dinner after this. So I want to make sure that your questions do get asked. So if I don't get to your questions, please just jot it down. I'll try to come around and uh, you can flag me down at some point. I want to make sure everyone gets the education they're looking for. So here we are, France, um, a country that we all love and respect um, in terms of the wine culture and heritage. And you look at this tiny little corner of France that we've devoted so much of our time and energy to, and that is Bordeaux. Um, we think of Bordeaux, again, it's the second largest wine region in France in terms of volume. It's the largest in terms of acreage um, under vine. Um, and when you look at it, the total land mass is about half of Rhode Island. So wouldn't that be cool just to like kind of wake up one day and drive down to Rhode Island, get past, uh, get past uh, Pawtucket and get into Providence and then just see vines stretched as far as you can see. That's essentially what we have here in Bordeaux. Um, tucked right up against the Atlantic coast. It's a huge region. Um, and again, there's a lot of different styles that come out of here and we won't touch on all of them today, unfortunately, but uh, we will get a pretty good overview of the quality that does exist. So what is it? Where is it? Why does it matter? Bordeaux, very simply put in French, board, near or next to, and O water. It's right on the Atlantic coast. Um, so it really makes sense that this was kind of the, the, the term that caught, you know, kind of caught the attention of the world. You know, the British always had certainly a ton of influence here um, throughout history. So it was more a reference to where it was located rather than its more traditional name of Aquitaine, which also has a reference to the water. Maritime climate, obviously. Um, this is critically important, especially in vintages. Um, you know, unfortunately, this vintage, 2017, um, the maritime climate wasn't able to save all of the sins of Mother Nature, so to speak. Um, because of, you know, we, we all know the Cape and the islands, when you go in the summer, it's a little bit cooler. Um, and then in the wintertime, it's always just a little bit warmer. It doesn't quite have the drastic extreme fluctuation in climate like you might see further inland, in places like Burgundy or Alsace or the Rhone Valley. Again, the Atlantic Ocean causes a little bit more coolness in the summer, but also gives it a little bit more warmth in the winter times, giving it a longer growing season. Um, but there is a bit of humidity as well. And we have two enormous rivers here um, flowing into the Gironde. Uh, the Garonne and the Dordogne, you can kind of see down here. Uh, the Garonne up to the north here, the Dordogne to the south, flowing into the estuary of the Gironde. Another moderating influence. So it's all about water here. It's all about really the exposure to water that gives it, again, a unique opportunity that a lot of other wine regions throughout Europe, and especially, not, uh, especially in France, an opportunity that uh, a lot of other regions don't enjoy. 
So a quick tour of history here. Uh, sixth century, uh, sixth century BC, this is when the first signs of winemaking started taking place. Albeit it's not the traditional winemaking that we see of, it's mainly uh, the Phoenicians and a lot of the Mediterranean cultures that were kind of sailing around and planting vines and just basically not necessarily using it exclusively for consumption, but also for medicinal purposes, sometimes for distillation later on um, as we get kind of into the, the early Middle Ages. Um, and then we get into 1152, the, the wedding of Eleanor of Aquitaine to Henry Plantagenet. Uh, this has always been a very, very sensitive spot in terms of the Franco and Anglo relations. Um, a lot of weddings were set up back then to basically preserve your dynasty, preserve your empire, and hopefully expand a little bit. Um, so the British and the French always were looking at Bordeaux. They were always looking at this area as a place where they could get together and really compromise. However, that led to uh, some kind of unrest and unsettlement, uh, the Hundred Years' War, uh, which was basically the French kicking the British out of mainland Europe, simply put. Uh, this lasted well over 100 years. It was, uh, it was brutal. Um, but what you really had was the French saying, au revoir, go back to your island. We don't need you in our territory anymore. We have our own kingdom to run here. Uh, 17th century. This is where winemaking really starts to take hold in terms of the quality that we see today. Again, we go back to the 6th century BC. However, it's the Dutch. And this is often overlooked throughout most of history because the Dutch have never been known as really fine connoisseurs of wine or great grape growers. Um, but what they were really good at was construction, uh, was good at mitigating floodlands, uh, was also really good at distillation. So the Dutch saw Bordeaux and they saw potential here. And they, they, the Dutch were, they played a huge role in draining a lot of the marshland. If we went back to that map, you can see again, it's right, you know, basically all this land, once upon a time, was marshland, fair, fairly uninhabitable. But the Dutch came in and saw, well, we can help you. We can help you with drainage. We can make sure we dig ditches. We can run these canals right to the river. So you can actually start to build on these properties. And then they started to see more vineyard land popping up. The Dutch also set a lot of prices in the international market. They bought a lot of the, the Bordeaux wine, uh, what was called Bordeaux wine at the time, for distillation back uh, in, in the Netherlands. And that was going to become Genever or gin. Uh, kind of some of the earliest days of gin in the 16th, 17th centuries uh, was based upon distillation of Bordeaux wine. So again, hugely important. This is where the Dutch got most of their raw product from. So even though it wasn't quite the standards that we think of today in terms of quality, it was some of the most sought after grape varietals for distillation. Again, times have changed. Thomas Jefferson, we give a lot of attribution about, uh, to Thomas Jefferson because of his influence and in discovering a lot of wines. Most recently, with a lot of historical research, uh, we're starting to unearth that Thomas Jefferson maybe was not quite the saint, uh, patron saint of Bordeaux that we all want him to be, and it might actually have been John Adams, which is kind of cool for us, you know, being in Massachusetts, uh, you know, having a, a local, a native son actually be a more, more of a promoter of Bordeaux. Um, but Thomas Jefferson in 1807 uh, uh, was actually in a big proponent of a nationalist treaty um, that shut off a lot of export of wine to the United States. They went from 22, uh, sorry, 22 million bottles uh, down to about 7 million bottles a year. Uh, so cut the production in by a third, which really, really crippled the Bordeaux wine industry. So again, we're kind of starting to learn a little bit more about this. More diaries and papers are being unearthed. Um, but we might want to start to twinge, you know, kind of tweak the way we think about Thomas Jefferson uh, for the moment. And again, it all comes back really to the British support throughout history. When they weren't fighting each other, when they weren't trying to, you know, kind of conquer one or the other, uh, you, know, set, you know, sailing their ships around the world, you know, planting their flag in the ground, saying this is for king and country. Um, they were celebrating the wine. The British have always loved Bordeaux wine. Um, and now, finally, they've started to actually be able to grow grapes in the British Isles a little bit. Um, but really, it's all about finding wine that suited their palate, and this, this idea of claret, this idea of a blended wine that just you know, was ethereal and wonderfully nuanced and complex. Um, they really wrapped their mind around, they, wrapped, they opened their wallets up for. So, the British were certainly a huge influence one way or the other. We'll see Chateau in a lot of these bottles. And again, this might be a little basic for some of you, but others I know are just starting their journey, so we want to make sure we cover all the, the, uh, the terminology you might see on the label. But what does it mean? What does Chateau actually mean when you actually see it on a bottle of wine? Well, first of all, it's a very different way of winemaking that a lot of people will profess right now. If you go to a region like Burgundy, or maybe it's, uh, you go to Napa Valley, there's a lot of talk about single vineyards. Um, again, it's just a philosophy that the vineyard is the most important piece of the winemaking process. Sure, in Burgundy, it's a little bit more diverse. You're dealing with a slope. It's a little bit trickier in terms of getting ripeness. Yeah, so vineyards will actually matter a whole lot more. In Bordeaux, it's about who manages your vines. It's about the ownership of that property. Because if you have somebody that owns a plot of land and they don't know what they're doing, they can take amazing fruit um, and they can turn it into something that's not necessarily amazing at all, something that's horrible. 
Um, but if you have a great ownership of maybe a mediocre vineyard, and they cultivate it, and they care for it, and they give it the, the love, and they nurture it, um, then all of a sudden you, be, you have something that's greater than it used to be. So it really is about know-how and experience here, and which is why we see a lot of family ownership, um, why we see a lot of, you know, again, these, these chateaus that were set up two, three, four hundred years ago, still in existence, and still being carried on by the same traditions, same families um, that started them way back when. I mean, it, it's a little bit about branding here. You know, we, we in the United States here, we're kind of brand junkies. We all know what's, you know, wh who makes your phone? Everybody knows that, right? Apple, Samsung, what kind of car do you drive? We all know that. This is the same kind of idea in Bordeaux. We're talking about brands. We're talking about places and people we can trust. And that's a little bit different. That's a little bit different because when we talk about quality, when we talk about vintages, we want to assume that the best quality is going to be produced no matter what by the best people, the people with the best know-how. So we get to a little bit of winemaking here. Again, we're kind of plowing through this um, quickly, but it's important to realize that Bordeaux makes wine in a very unique style. Um, and again, it's, a lot of it does involve new oak. One thing that Bordeaux has always had a lot of throughout history is money. And what a new oak barrel, who can fathom a guess of what that costs in the open market right now? 900 euro, probably closer to 11, 1200 euro now in some, for some of the top coopers, um, for some of the top forests. We're now getting into terroir of forests now. Um, but you know, we're talking about an average price of $4 per bottle that you're spending just on oak. That's a lot of money to spend on oak, especially if you are trying to basically turn your wine over quickly, uh, if you're trying to you know, really work on thin margins. Oak is something you can't really afford. Um, the other thing is time. How long does an average bottle of Bordeaux sit in the chateau? High quality Bordeaux? Maybe a year, maybe two years, maybe three years, some even four. Time is money, time is space in your chateau, in your wine cellar. A lot of people say just get it out and sell it, I need the cash flow. Some properties say our wine isn't ready, our wine needs to mature, our wine needs to rest. The challenge is we have the variable weather. Certainly weather is always a big deal no matter what we're talking about because uh, in the wine world, it's an agricultural product. We can't lose sight of that. We're growing fruit. Weather's, Mother Nature, I mean, if everyone's kept, you know, again, we see frost, we see hail throughout most of Europe. We see Napa Valley just spike to about 108 degrees yesterday and into today. Um, it's something to deal with. Um, but again, Bordeaux being right on the Atlantic, it's very, it, it moderates it. But we do have a lot of fog, a lot of wind, a lot of rain. That can put it, you know, give you certainly some challenges. Humidity equals mold. We'll talk about this a little bit by 99% of the time, mold is a bad thing. Mold is a very bad thing. It can ruin your crop. There's, no, there's some chemicals you can use. They don't always work. It can devastate an entire vineyard. Mold's a problem, which is why we need to deal with really hardy grape varieties. So finally, we're going to talk. This is more of kind of an eye chart for you just to look at. For those who are looking at vintages and like, well, I've heard about this vintage, um, all of these will be available um, to email out. I'll make sure that Eric has a copy of this and we can distribute this. Um, but for those of you who are looking to collect, here's just kind of, uh, you know, kind of your best, uh, you know, your, top, uh, your, you know, your top 15 and since 1961. Um, you know, we've been blessed with a couple of great vintages in the last decade or so in Bordeaux. There's a lot of consistency that you don't have to worry about again. Um, in other regions, um, you know, it's a little bit more challenging, the highs and lows. But again, you look at this, a lot of wine regions would love to have this kind of pedigree, this kind of legacy to be able to pass on. So let's talk a little bit about the region here, and then we'll start getting into tasting wines, because that's, I think, why we're all here. So again, here's our region of Bordeaux, again, the landmass of Rhode Island, from the Gironde in the north, uh, moving south, kind of moving south, the Dordogne, off to the north, the Garonne to the south. Big landmass in the middle here, and um, we'll talk a little bit about these regions as we move forward, but let's talk first about grape varietals. Cabernet Sauvignon for reds, Merlot. Merlot is actually the most widely planted grape varietal in all of Bordeaux. Most people want you to kind of think the Cabernet is the, is the lead horse here, but it's more prestigious, it's a little bit more temperamental. Merlot does very, very well in wet soils. Again, we talked about water a lot. We talked about the ocean, we talked about rivers, we talked about marshland, we talked um, a lot about draining these, these areas, but there's a lot of clay um, where Merlot succeeds. And what is clay? It's something that's moist, it's cool. Help it to, to retains water. Merlot loves to have its feet wet. I love to kind of refer to it that way. Cabernet Sauvignon hates having its feet wet. It loves dry soil. It loves gravelly soil, stony soil. When it rains, Cabernet likes to have it just go straight through, down, so it can actually find the water when it wants it, as opposed to just having it thrust upon its rootstock. White wines. Again, a lot of people start to think about Bordeaux, and they don't get to experience white wines. Um, it's a shame, because some of the white wines of Bordeaux are some of the, some of the most amazing white wines in the entire world, full stop. 
And there are some great white wines to just enjoy on warm summer days as well. Um, but we talk about Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon. So these, again, are grape varietals that are very aromatic. They're very fresh. They're very high in acid. Um, they love having this kind of diversity of soil. They tend to prefer chalk, limestone, or a mix thereof. Um, but they can thrive even in gravel as well. You know, these kind of soils that give you a lower pH, um, Sauvignon Blanc th you know, thrives in. Because it's such a high acid grape variety, I need something to help cut that out a little bit. And then at the bottom, you see actually some blending varietals for both red and white. Red varietals, you see these things like Carmenere, Mer uh, Malbec, Petit Verdot, whites, Muscadel, Colombard, Merlot Blanc, Sauvignon Gris, and Uni Blanc. You often don't see these, certainly not as a lead role. Carmenere is nearly extinct in Bordeaux. Petit Verdot, five, maybe six percent in some wines. It's a very spicy grape varietal. Malbec we see a ton of, just not in Bordeaux. We see it in Argentina, we see it down in Cahors, um, we see it in other regions, kind of in the south, uh, southwest of France. But Bordeaux has kind of always seen it as more of an accessory varietal as more of a dominant varietal. So moving forward here, um, here's kind of the guidelines to play with um, when you look at your dry wines versus your sweet wines. Uh, your dry white wines will be mainly based on Sauvignon Blanc. It is the more noble grape varietal. It is the more aromatic grape varietal. Semillon provides a really laser-like backbone, um, a lot of acidity, a lot of minerality, whereas Sauvignon Blanc provides a lot of floral, a lot of tropical, a lot of really high citrus tones. And they work really well together. Your sweet white wines, it's reversed. So Semillon takes the lead dog role, and Sauvignon play, Blanc plays a little bit more of a backseat role. Because when you're talking about sweet wines, we're talking about something called botrytis that settles in, um, which is this gnarly stuff. Um, you look at this, and it's a brave, brave person that decided that they looked at this grape, that grape right there and said, I can make wine out of that. That looks delicious. <laughs> when this grape is sitting right there, it's like, no, that's not, that's not quite for me. I want, I want these gnarly ones right in here um, that are rotten and look like raisins on the vine. Semillon is a, uh, is a fairly uh, thin-skinned grape varietal, high amounts of acid. So this mold sets in. This is called Botrytis cinerea, um, the noble rot. So while I talked about a lot of rot being bad at the outset, this is the one rot that is actually great. Um, this, this is one of those things that Mother Nature created, and you're like, how on earth did somebody come up with this idea? How did, this, how did everything come together perfectly to make one, again, kind of the most luxurious dessert-style wines out there? Again, very, very bold thinking. So uh, Semillon, high acid. This, this bowl dehydrates a grape essentially from the inside out. It sets on the grape. It set, filaments start to burrow in. They go in. They basically dehydrate the grape. So what you're left with looks like a raisin, a really moldy raisin. But you have increased sugar. You have increased acidity. And you have concentration of flavors. It takes a lot longer to ferment because you have so much sugar. But when you taste it, it's all imbalanced. It's perfect. It's got acid. It's got sweet. It's got these wonderful mushroomy notes. It's got saffron and ginger and exotic spices. That is only because of this mold. Semillon by itself doesn't taste like a lot on its own. It tastes kind of like, like lemon, like high acid lemon water. Um, but this makes it something far more complex. So here when we talk about our white wines, we're going to talk mainly about uh, this region of Pessac Leonion, which sits to the south and southeast of the Cité de Bordeaux. Um, Pessac Leonion, uh, created an appellation created in the 1950s. That was the highest uh, quality appellation for white wine. Um, then you have Grave, uh, the larger appellation, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of north to south. Then you have Ceron, Barsac, and Sauternes so in yellow here, which are your traditional sweet wine appellations. But that being said, let's pick up a glass, because I think this is the important thing to do right now, um, is start tasting some wine. So wines one and two, I want everyone to kind of look at right now. And I'll actually go back to this in a second. So wines one and two, it's on your tasting sheet, um, but also I'll have the wines up here, so you don't need to keep looking down. But if you do want to take notes on your sheet, please do. Um, just be sure that uh, whoever uh, turns in their, uh, their kind of answers on the back of their tasting sheet um, is okay with actually parting with it for a little bit. We'll try to get it back to you for sure. Um, but wine number one, Chateau Bonnet, uh, Entre du Mer. And wine number two, Chateau Fusel from Pessac Léonion. So we chose these two wines, uh, one to kind of give you an exhibit of freshness and liveliness. Um, Sauvignon Blanc dominated uh, for Chateau Bonnet. You know, it is 50%, but 40% uh, Semillon. Very fresh, very lively, very aromatic. So we'll go back to our kind of profile here. These are meant to put ideas in your head. These are meant to kind of be a guideline for what you're tasting. Some of you will be more attuned to what you know, kind of your, your senses are telling you. Some of you stick your nose in this glass of wine and go, I smell wine. And that's totally cool. Because again, no one, a fellow master sommelier, Jeff Cruz, said no one is ever born a gifted samurai sword maker. It takes years and years and years and years of practice to become a great samurai sword maker. Why would we expect people to be naturally gifted at something like wine? 
it's the same kind of thing. It takes time, it takes evolution, it takes training. It takes a lot of drinking it, which is usually a good thing. The more you taste wine, the more you experience wine, the better you get at it. Um, and it's one of those great things that, um, you know, again, you, you're going to stop and smell the roses, literally, from here on out, because you want to really understand better what a rose smells like. You want to understand better what peach smells like. We all know what, I mean, we have, we have you know, candles that sell, you know, lemon fresh is the one thing that I always, I always laugh at, because we assume we know what lemon is because we get this chemical kind of composition of what lemon is, and we smell lemon. Okay, but have we ever stopped and smelled freshly grated lemon zest? Freshly squeezed lemon, lemon pie, lemon curd, lemon custard, Meyer lemon versus a, a traditional lemon. I mean, think about all these iterations and all these different things we can smell. We can smell thousands and thousands of things. But do we really actually stop and smell them and, and take notice of them? That's the, that's the challenge for all of you. Uh, as you. As you kind of exit this room at the end of the night, is to you know, pay a little bit more attention to what we're smelling, what we're drinking, what we're enjoying. That's half the fun of exploration. So for the first wine, what do we smell? This is where we get a little bit more participation here. What do we smell in this wine? Grape, grapefruit? grapefruit? Green apple, grapefruit. Pineapple. Pineapple. Anything else? Fairly aromatic, right? I mean, you, I can smell this wine just, and I have a, I have a fan here trying to keep me from sweating profusely, um, but I, have a, I, I can smell this glass, you know, not even sticking my nose into it. It just jumps out of the glass for me. It's very effusive, very lively, very jubilant wine, if you will. So anything else is popping out here? Lemon. lemon. Springtime in Germany. Springtime in I don't even know what that means, but I love it. Peach. Peach. See, it, it's amazing. You stick your nose in, all of a sudden other things start popping up. It's like, oh, and then you start to remember flavor memories from when you were a child or when you're um, at, uh, you know, at a friend's house or you know, your grandmother's house. All these things start flooding back to you once you start to unlock this kind of hidden language of what wine's all about. It's really about memory. How do, we, how do we know what a lemon smells like? Well, we remember it. We think about it. We spend some time embracing it, and then it becomes part of our flavor memory. It becomes part of our, our language when we start to enjoy wine. Take a sip. What do we taste? Does it taste the same? Does it taste different? Yeah, from the smell. Yeah, sorry. Same or different from the smell? Different. You get, you, get, you get a little bit of vanilla. You get a little bit of kind of a, you know, kind of a, a more kind of robust, uh, rounder profile. Absolutely. A lot of acid. Anyone feel like their mouth is watering? Yeah, you kind of, you, it's, it's a wonderful feeling because that's, that's basically this wine acting like windshield wipers on our palate. Acid helps to cleanse your palate. Acid is, it sounds like a bad thing. We talk about high acid wines. We talk about acidi acidity in wine. It sounds really bad. Um, but it's great because this is what keeps our mouth fresh. This is why you can pair up high acid wines with rich foods. One of my favorite things in the world is champagne and french fries. Why? French fries are rich, they're oily, they're greasy, they're delicious and salty. What's champagne? High in acid. All of a sudden you have one of the highest acid wines on the planet with one of the richest foods on the planet. I'm happy. It's deli I encourage all of you to try it. Go out to a nice restaurant, order a great bottle of champagne and french fries. It, McDonald's drive through too. Don't drink and drive. Um, but, you know, yeah, again, yeah, take Uber. That's fine. Have the Uber pull up. Uh, go through the McDonald's drive through with a glass of champagne. Um, it's amazing when you start to pay attention physiologically what wine can do to you, aside from make you feel, feel good. Um, it actually affects other parts of your body. And I want you to contrast that with wine number two, which is the Chateau Fusal, which is from 2006. This has a little bit more aging. This is a balance of 50-50 Sauvignon Blanc Semillon but there's 50% new oak on this. So we go back to this slide a little bit. Full disclosure, wine number one, the Chateau Bonnet, had no oak whatsoever. Stainless steel, meant to be fresh, crisp, clean as a daisy. This second wine, Chateau Fusal, sits in barrel. Going to get a little bit of maturity. New oak as well. So when we stick our nose in this glass, what are we smelling? Honey, buttery. Yeah, oak. De defi I wanted to find oak a little bit more. You said oak. What gives you that idea of oak? I was told you ask all the questions. Yeah, butter, vanilla. You know, things like caramel, toasted bread. Like what? 
pear, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. There's, there's a lot of st tree fruit, pears and apples, um, you know, quince, you know, Asian pear, things like that. You know, added semion and then barrel aging. There's also something called leaves contact, which takes place, which I didn't mention on the previous slide, because again, you go down, far down the rabbit hole of winemaking, you can unlock a whole, a whole bunch of different doors. But there's this toasty almondy walnut, hazelnut, something that gives you almost like a fresh baked brioche. And what happens is they just let the yeast, after fermentation, settle on the bottom in the barrel and just stir it up and gives it that kind of rich, toasty flavor. Added complexity. This is why white Bordeaux, quality white Bordeaux, aged white Bordeaux, is some of the most underrated white wines in the world. Maybe not in this room, but, in the, but out there in the wine world. Because people often associate Bordeaux with only red wines. One of the biggest challenges as a sommelier was to get people to even approach white Bordeaux. Because when we taste this, and taste this wine, you maintain a lot of that acidity Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon bring to the table, but now you start to get a fuller, waxier, more you know, kind of creamier style of wine, but yet still really clean and precise. It's incredibly hard to do this without that perfect confluence of weather and winemaking technique and almost a little bit of luck. So cool, in the interest of time, we're just going to kind of move on to some red wines. Um, since we have five of them, uh, we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time here. But again, so, some generic guidelines to think about when we approach Bordeaux as a whole. Again, we're walking into a restaurant. We're sitting down with the wine list. I love this context now. Um, where we see they have left bank on the menu and right bank on the menu. OK, what does that mean? That's not a grape varietal. It's, it's an area in Bordeaux. Left bank, generally speaking, is very gravelly. This is a lot of the area where the Dutch came in and unearthed these giant gravel uh, croups. They call, uh, they're basically gravel piles. And a lot of the great chateaus on the left bank um, are built upon these, these gra you know, kind of gravelly uh, outcroppings. Um, so you have Cabernet Sauvignon. Again, Cabernet loves having drainage. It loves having its feet dry. It can just sit there. Uh, gravel tends to be a warmer soil um, because it absorbs sun during the day and can reflect it back up uh, gradually at night. A little bit of Merlot um, planted here and there. It's about 30% or so. And then you'll see some Cabernet Franc and some Petit Verdot um, you know, kind of taking that role as well. You move to the right bank. Saint Emilion, Pomerol, much more clay based and limestone based soils. This is where water gets retained. And again, Merlot loves having its feet wet. Merlot takes center stage. In fact, the second most popular grape isn't Cabernet Sauvignon, it's Cabernet Franc. So Cabernet Franc tends to be, it enjoys a cooler climate. Um, it's a shorter ripening season. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of uh, kind of hedging your bets here because um, Merlot will ripen a little bit after Cabernet Franc. So if you're on the right bank and it's too wet, and your Merlot, Merlot gets kind of rotten, or you know, maybe the vin, you know, it just doesn't quite get ripe enough, Cabernet Franc is a pretty reliable blending partner to have in there, which is why they go very, very well together. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some family history. Um, and uh, you know, everyone always is surprised when I put the family history of Bordeaux, red grape varietals, leading off with Cabernet Franc. Um, because it's such a, in most people's minds, an unimportant grape varietal. It's an accessory. It's a blending grape. Sure, there are some great wines like Cheval Blanc, which makes a lot, a high percentage of Cabernet Franc in their wine. But why does Cabernet Franc always start at the top here? Um, it's because once upon a time, and this is only about three, four, five hundred years ago, um, Cabernet Sauvignon didn't exist. Believe it or not, there was a time on this planet where Cabernet Sauvignon did not exist. What a very sad time. It's unbelievable. Um, but kind of like, you know, kind of like children, um, you know, so, when you cross different grape varietals, you get different expressions no matter what. You can never repeat the same expression of a crossing um, unless it's just unbelievable luck. Um, so what happened is you had people that were you know, cross-pollinating Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc, and all of a sudden you had this new grape varietal pop up that was thicker skinned, uh, more pigmented, uh, and did really, really well in this area, and that was Cabernet Sauvignon. But that kind of leaves away uh, kind of the other half of the, uh, the equation here. And you have this grape varietal called Magdalene Noir, which is not used in quality wine production, but because, again, this was four, five, six hundred years ago, you had, you know, you had Magdalene Noir around that was just being grown and being made into wine because people didn't know any better, and they crossed and they became Merlot. So it's like you have two different offspring of Cabernet Franc, um, and this is why Cabernet Franc is critically important to the survival of Bordeaux, because without it, all these other grape varieties would never have existed. And the other grape varieties I put down here, and again, I apologize for those in the back, you can't see it, but Petit Verdot and Malbec. Uh, Petit Verdot, we have no idea actually where it came from. Um, it just kind of appeared one day. Uh, we think it came from the Pyrenees, where a lot of different grape varieties came from, and um, the history is very, very uncertain. And then you have Malbec, 
which is actually a half, a half sibling of, of Merlot uh, with Magdalene Noir, but blended with Prunillard, another minor grape varietal. So there's a lot of kind of, you know, kind of similarities between all these grapes. They are related. Um, there is a lot of, you know, kind of, well, you know, Merlot tastes like Malbec. You put a, a varietal Merlot up against a varietal Malbec, say like Merlot from California and Malbec from Argentina, there's a lot of similarities. And this is why all these grapes go so well together, because there's enough crossover between one varietal and the next. And now we're talking about unique differences in things like Cabernet Franc, which can be a little bit more green and vegetal. Cabernet Sauvignon should be a little more dark and kind of brooding. Merlot, which is more red and black fruit. Uh, Petit Verdot, which is spicy. Malbec, which is buoyant and happy and joyful. Carbonara, which is again kind of green and a little bit more kind of weedy and smoky. You blend all these things together and you get, it's like a chef in the kitchen. Now you get something amazing. Well, how'd you do it? Well, I don't know. I just kind of threw it all together and saw what happened. Fortunately, people started writing down recipes and houses started coming up with formulas of their wine. Um, and this is why, again, the Bordelais have always been very smart. They've never put all of their eggs in one basket. They've never banked upon one grape varietal to carry them. Um, it's always been about blending. Because from vintage to vintage, they are guaranteed, asterisk, uh, to get a fairly consistent, reliable product. And that's really what a lot of people want in the world. We love Starbucks around every corner. We want, we want reliability, especially when we spend money on wine. We want, to, we want to be good. There's nothing wrong with that. And Bordeaux realized that a lot earlier than a lot of other people. So here again, we're moving to the left bank first for our first couple of wines. Uh, it's uh, three, four, and five. Um, so again, left bank, um, we'll focus on this in, our, in, a, in a following seminar, but up here in the Midoc, uh, this is generally thought of lower quality. It's closer to the Atlantic, a little bit more marshy. Um, you get a little bit too much ocean influence here. But again, you're going to see some vineyards popping up here with very uh, respectable quality wines. And then you get into the Haute Medoc, which encompasses most of your high quality uh, villages, communes, and appellations on the left bank. The further south you go, the more inland you get, uh, the less you know, kind of buffeted you are by the ocean. Um, and also you get a little bit less of that marshland. Uh, you move a little more to hard gravel and stone as you get down to Pessac Leonion. So here's wines three, four, and five. Um, so again, we'll kind of walk through these. Um, wine number three is, again, something that's quite, you know, again, very humble. Um, there's a lot of inexpensive Bordeaux out there, but I find that this producer, Chateau Grezac, always does very well. Despite the vintage, despite the price point, it always delivers a very reliable wine. It, is relied on, it, is, it does rely on Merlot, and it is from the Medoc. So again, moving back a slide, we saw the Medoc up to the north. What I say the Medoc had more of than the rest of... It has more marshland. It's wetter up here. What does Cabernet hate? Wet. This is why Merlot does best up here in the Medoc. This is why Chateau Graysac uses almost two-thirds Merlot, even though it's on the left bank. So everything I talked about being left bank Cabernet, uh, forget that for now. So here we go. Chateau Graysac, on the nose, what do we smell? Leather. Coffee, leather. Here's some cheat sheet for you. Graphite. Plum. And think Merlot. Merlot is a little bit more of a buoyant, softer fruit. I mean, it's a little bit more kind of happy and cheerful than Cabernet. Cabernet always seems to be kind of either angry and storming around um, and very dark. Um, but Merlot always has a little bit more buoyancy to it. Mix of red and black fruit. So plum and cherries, forest floor, mushrooms. Yeah, even again, a very humble wine. This is a Cru Bourgeois. Uh, it's $16.99 or so plus or minus a couple of dollars. Um, but it really shows off, I think, what Merlot does well in Bordeaux, and that's deliver, again, friendly wine, approachable wine, soft, plump, framed with tannin, certainly, because we get 30% Cabernet. So Cabernet is not totally blown out of the water here by the Merlot. You still get the structure. You still get that dark fruit. You still get the tannins. Um, you still get kind of the echo of what Cabernet Sauvignon is all about, even though Merlot is certainly the lead role. And then a little bit of Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot. Using it like, you know, like a chef would use salt and pepper in the kitchen or some herbs and spices, just to give a little bit more accent to flavor. So now when we taste the wine, does it taste similar? Does it taste different? For me, mocha, black plum, almost a liqueur, almost a liqueur note. Yeah, black fruits, black berries, black licorice. Yeah. I mean, this, this, we're talking about a lot of complexity for this wine. And again, that's the benefit of using four different grape varietals. They embrace this idea of, again, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Um, a lot of, again, 
in California, they run away from that idea. They want to display the grape varietal proudly, even though they might be blending in other things because they want people to think, this is what Cabernet tastes like. This is what Merlot tastes like. Bordeaux's like, we're just going to make our wine. This is our chateau profile. Our wine's going to taste like our wine. That's all we want it to taste like. Vintage to vintage consistency. So uh, wine number two here, or sorry, wine number four, uh, 2005 Grand Puy Lacoste. This was parted with very, very um, uh, cheapishly by Angelo. Um, I asked him for this wine. He's like, well, that's not even ready to go yet. It's 2005, and it's amazing. Um, but in terms of the power and prestige of what Cabernet Sauvignon delivers, I think it's important to taste wine even when it's not quite at its, quote, best. Because it's important to see the varietal, important to see the structure, which then allows you to actually age wine for decades. Um, because right now, I mean, if we just kept this in the cellar for another 10, 15 years, it would be great. But would we ever see the power of what Cabernet Sauvignon brings to the table and why these wines are so age-worthy? So when we smell this wine, for me, you lost that really playful note, that kind of almost kind of jubilant red fruit um, from the gray sack. And now it's much more dark, dark tones, black fruit, bramble fruit, black raspberry, uh, black plum, black cherry, licorice. You know, get a little bit more of that, that cassis, creme de cassis, chambord. Um, things that are just big and rich and, you know, almost stewed in terms of their quality. Um, that's, again, that's, that's Cabernet Sauvignon. To keep it from becoming too overpowering, to keep it from becoming too tannic, they do blend in Merlot. Um, and in 2005, you had, you know, basically a, a spectacular vintage where everything ripened perfectly. You had all, basically your entire arsenal at your disposal to make wine that you felt lived up to the standards of your chateau. So they decided to eliminate any sort of other accessory varietal. Their quality of their Cabernet and Merlot, they felt was enough. Because it is common to have a couple of percent of Petit Verdot, a couple of percent of Cabernet Franc. They decided this was the best way to go, showing off Cabernet and Merlot side by side. So cool. Uh, so that was the 05 Grand Puy Lacoste. And then we have something um, really fun here. Um, not that all the wines aren't fun, but uh, 1996. And now we start to see a little bit of age um, coming here on the wine. Um, Chateau Lagrange and St. Julien. A little bit reduced in terms of Cabernet, um, certainly not the blockbuster vintage of 05. Um, you know, maybe not even considered one of the top two vintages of the decade, but I think the wines um, in these kind of quote off vintages or more challenging vintages, I think age um, a little bit more interestingly at a quicker pace. So we're 21 years of age here. Again, we see Cabernet, uh, about a third Merlot, a little bit of Petit Verdot. And again, your little cheat sheet here uh, between red grapes and, and uh, Kind of so with oak and with age, start to see more of those age notes. It's things like soy, leather, uh, mushrooms, tobacco, dried herbs. Um, you get a little bit more, again, oxidation starts to take place. And if the wine has enough fruit, has enough tannin, the tannin will actually serve as a protectant. It will bind with oxygen before it actually allows the wine to oxidize and become kind of over the hill. Bell pepper. I like bell pepper. Bell pepper is a fantastic uh, benchmark for Cabernet Sauvignon, especially in less ripe vintages, especially with a little bit of uh, Cabernet uh, Franc thrown in there. What else do we smell on the nose here? Leather. Leather. You know, almost like a mix of... Yeah, a good barnyard smell. Yeah, like a, like a, a saddle, um, you, know, you know, some sort you know, of like a, like a new leather shoe, maybe just lightly worn. How about on the palate? What do we taste? Is it any different? Is it similar? Black pepper corn or green bell pepper? Green bell pepper. Does everybody kind of get that green bell pepper note? It's something very, very unique to Bordeaux and Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. Again, you look at the parentage. Um, you know, again, Cabernet Franc begat Cabernet Sauvignon. There's this very, it's a chemical compound called a pyrazine, which go and cut a green bell pepper, go and roast a green bell pepper over a fire. And again, how, who's smelled a green bell pepper before? Intentionally. Yeah, I mean, not, not many of us. Three, four, five of us. You know, I, I, I think you've never really experienced wine until you've gotten kicked out of a grocery store for walking around smelling all the fruit and vegetables. Um, but yeah, I mean, smell a bell pepper. It really is there. And again, it's a chemical compound in Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc that is unique and is a benchmark really for what, you know, kind of, again, Bordeaux wine, because of that moderate climate, it's not as hot as Napa, 
Napa can't get pyrazines like this. Napa can't get that bell pepper. This is why Bordeaux is always identifiable and has this additional kind of herbal uh, complexity. So, wine number six, the Chateau Dassault, 2000, larger regards, a fantastic vintage, 65% Merlot, 30% Cabernet Franc, 5% Cabernet Sauvignon. Jumping back to our cheat sheet here, what are some aromas that we get off of wine number six? Plum. Fresh plum or dried plum? plum? Both. Absolutely. This is a great vintage. 2000 is a great vintage. There's a lot of ripe fruit. Um, there's also a balance of acidity. There's also some new oak here. Again, new oak helps to protect the wine, so you actually, 17 years in, can get a balance of ripe, fresh, and starting to oxidize dried fruit. It's one of the joys of tasting these wines over their lifespan. You get this kind of crossover of youth and maturity. Floral, no. Blackberries. What kind of, yeah, floral. For me, Merlot is always much prettier than Cabernet Sauvignon. It's much more aromatic. Things like violets and roses. Um, a lot more floral nature here in, in, in Merlot. Um, and again, it's, it's just a little bit lighter in style. There's a lot more red fruit, so it often kind of dances across the palate. Where again, Cabernet Sauvignon kind of stomps its way through because it's heavier and bolder and more powerful. And I put down here, Merlot is overrated till it's underrated. Uh, Merlot kind of has this vacillation between its it's something I don't want to grow because everybody grows it and then, oh, I really want to grow it because it's amazing. Um, it, it, no one really quite knows what to make a Merlot, despite the fact it's grown in some of the most you know, expensive and noble uh, land in all of Bordeaux. Um, and then Cabernet Franc, hey, I was mentioned in Sideways, it's always a supporting cast member in Bordeaux. It's always the grape file that kind of gets forgotten, but provides acidity, provides structure, provides balance um, to a lot of the riper, juicier flavors, certainly of Merlot. So uh, wine number seven is the Croix St. George. It is Pomerol. A lot more iron in the soil in Pomerol. Um, so it is clay-based, but there is a, a very a redness to the soil here. So if you taste something like iron or kind of like a, a meatiness to the wine, absolutely. That's a, that's a benchmark of Pomerol, how you differentiate between uh, saint Emilion and Pomerol is that, that iron, that kind of really kind of minerality there. Um, but again, we're 95% Merlot now. We're really more about purity of varietal um, in Pomerol. Um, it, you often will find a lot more dominant, you know, if not 100%, very, very close to 100% varietal wines in Pomerol. Merlot just does very, very well here. And it's their benchmark. It provides that, again, grace, that suppleness, that ripeness, that polish of tannin, that oftentimes you have to blend a bunch of different grapes in to get that finished product. All right, what do we think about wine number seven? The, uh, the Croix St. Georges. Different? Similar? Did I catch wine? I'm thirsty. Some people? No? Different. Different. Different good, different bad, different how? Yeah. Softer, riper, um, kind of a, a nice, a more subtle, graceful entrance, and then powerful tannin. Saint Emilion has more limestone. Limestone gives it a little bit more aggressiveness. Again, this iron gives it a little bit more kind of suppleness and roundness. All right, so uh, our final wine here. Can we go back to our old friend here? Who remembers the name of this? Nastiness, Botrytis, Noble Rot. So wine number eight. I'm pretty sure that's the only wine left. It is number eight. Um, so now we're gonna talk about, again, again, this is a Botrytis affected wine. This is one of the, um, I say this with all the love in the world, the freak shows of mother nature. There is no explanation as why this tastes good. There is no explanation of why this actually, you know, happens other than sheer luck. Um, they say you have to be a special kind of crazy to make botrytis affected wines anywhere in the world because you can't control it, you can't predict it. It is 100% up to mother nature. Um, people have tried to inoculate fruit with botrytis. They've tried to do it in uh, sterile environments with some success, but to have it occur in nature, uh, certainly one of those most unique experiences. So we have 2003 Chateau La Tour Blanche. This was a, a warm vintage, and because oftentimes warm doesn't necessarily equate to quality white grapes. Um, warm does not exclude humidity. And what is required for botrytis is actually humidity. So you can have a warm vintage and it won't, you know, it actually might be a, a, su a superb vintage for Sautern and botrytis affected wines. So again, back to our little cheat sheet here. Totally different flavors than we're even gonna talk about with our first two white wines because we have this concentration and oxidation and raisination here on the vine. So tasting this, 
What do we smell? What do we taste? Syrup. syrup. Honey. Honey, syrup. I mean, it's sticky, it's waxy, orange, orange blossom, marmalade, pineapples, mangoes. Relative, it feels low acidity. So the, the, the comment was, this is low acidity. In its, in its palate, the acid gets wiped out. If it, did, if it had low acidity, this would be flabby, it would be sticky, it would be over the top. But because of that concentration of acidity, now it actually is a little bit cleaner, a little bit fresher than it actually perceives to be. Yeah, lower, absolutely. But because it's riper, but then the concentration, it kind of actually finds a stability that's pretty close to actually an acid to what we had before. All right, so we're actually pretty good to being right on schedule, so um, I'm kind of impressed by that. Um, was there any, any, other, uh, any other questions before we kind of wrap things up? What, what, are, what are the price points? Price points. Uh, well, wine number one was, again, $15, $15 or so. Wine number three was $16 or so. Price points, um, priceless, because they've been cellared perfectly by, by Eric and uh, the team here. But in terms of release prices, do you know that off the top of your head? Yep, that was, yep, 16. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's around usually 50 to 60, I think. Yep. Priceless. Price. Okay. <laughs> so every, everything really is uh, kind of below, you know, up on, you know, upon release below a hundred dollars. Yeah. So it's just, I mean, you, and you taste some of these wines, and that's the, again the benefit of age is it adds value. Um, if you, if you have the patience, um, oftentimes Bordelais wines will reward you for being patient, even the very, very modest vintages. Yes? What would you say is price for outside of restaurants? Yeah. Yes, outside of restaurants. Retail price would be under $100. Inside restaurants, depending upon the generosity of your wine director, um, then that, that will differ. But One second. Yes, in the back, sir. Two questions on Sauterne, yes. Mm-hmm. Yep, excellent question. So one is, does Sauterne age longer than red or white? And two, does it become actually less sweet over time? So answer the question number one, yes. Just because of what is going on in Sauterne, you have higher acid, you have generally uh, some new oak, and then you have sugar. Those are three protective elements in the wine. That, you know, basically you have the other two, certainly if you have new oak and acidity in reds and whites, but you don't have sugar. Sugar is a great protectant of wine. That's why some of the longest lived wines have high levels of sugar. Um, so, and then, sorry, I forgot the second part of your question. The second part is, do they get less sweet? Less sweet, yes. So the perception of sweetness will mellow out over time. I mean, it's impossible for the sugar to actually go away, but the complexity, um, you will get some sugar actually precipitate out with the tartrates. Um, so as you see those little wine diamonds, there will be some sugar locked up in there. So you will actually lose a little bit of sweetness over time, but it does tend to gain a, a bit more of a lusciousness and viscosity. And bonus, bonus question. There's, I get confused about, there's another kind of juicier sauce, process that's a great sauce. Barsac. 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 So the question is um, Barsac and Sauterne. So, Barsac is a commune that is right next door to Sauterne, um, basically right on the Cirone River. Um, so you have Sauterne, you have Barsac. Both can be labeled under AOC Sauterne. But um, Sauterne is the, mo is the more prestigious. Barsac is, you know, again, it's under the classification. It's under the, um, the appellation. People kind of think of Sauterne as being higher quality. 
I, I, don't, I won't argue one way or the other. Uh, it's just more of a perception thing. But BARSAC can be labeled as saw turn. So there's a question right down here. Yes? Uh, we poured the, we decanted these wines uh, at five o'clock. We started the decanting, so between five and six. Which of these would have the biggest, best, or negative effect? So the question was, which wine would have the biggest effect um, for aeration and decanting? And I would say it would have to be the 2005 Grand Puy Lacoste because it's the youngest, or not the youngest, but it has the most density. It's the tightest, uh, most tightly wound wine. The more oxygen that wine can get in the glass, the better. Um, the wine that probably did not need as much would be the 96 Lagrange, Lagrange um, or the, uh, the 2000. Uh, you know, it's, I, you know, again, it, it, the Dassault. Um, again, the older the wine gets, the less you want to shake it up and you know, aerate it because um, it'll start to help it fall apart. <laughs>